to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. We have a discussion of a great new book for you today. And I just want to say off the top, though, that I, I know some folks who have had books come out over the past couple of months, uh, a couple of whom we've, we've featured on the show and I really feel for them because when you have a book come out, you do a launch, you maybe do some talks, you go to different locations, and it really serves as this celebration of having the book come out. There's so much that goes into a book, the, the research, the writing, there's just the stress that's involved. You know, it's usually a, a multi-year process to get these things out. So... To not have those, uh, I, I feel I feel for the folks who have had books come out. And with Stage 3 coming in Ontario later this week, uh, you know, the numbers across the country continue to look good. Hopefully we can keep on this track. People wear masks, continue to distance, the numbers get lower, and we can start to have some distanced gatherings. Uh, you know, Outside is great, where we can keep distance as well, keep things safe so that the folks who have had stuff come out can really have an opportunity to celebrate the achievement of having a book released. And one of those books that I know has had several events canceled is by Alex Suchin, a military historian who has written a, a book on a topic that I think is really fascinating because every time that I've been in a class that has touched on the Second World War, there has been discussions of the industrial shift towards war production at the start of the Second World War as, as factories changed over to produce planes, tanks, munitions, whatever was necessary for the Canadian military. And very little, if anything, ever gets discussed about what happened to that stuff at the end of the war. And that is the subject of Alex's new book. It's called War Junk. Munitions Disposal and Post-War Reconstruction in Canada just came out from UBC Press. The hardcover, soft cover is coming out in the fall. So I was very pleased to talk with Alex about the book, and he was nice enough to join me all the way from Kingston, Ontario. Alex, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, very excited to talk about the book. Again, it's War Junk, Munitions Disposal and Post-War Reconstruction in Canada. And Alex, before we get into some of the content of the book, I'm just curious what it's been like for you to have this book come out in the midst of a, of a global pandemic. You know, I know when the, the book that I did a few years ago came out, a big part of it, of the sort of the finishing of it, when it actually felt finished, was having the launch and, and having all these people around and having this event that, that felt like a moment of culmination. So I, I certainly feel for you that I know you've had to cancel a bunch of stuff uh, in the midst of all this, but what has this process been like for you? Uh, it, you know, it was, uh, well, exhilarating finally having the book uh, out and ready and, and, you know, you've been working on it for 10 years and then suddenly the sort of regular uh, uh, number of events and fanfare suddenly is all canceled. Uh, you know, I had seven conferences canceled or postponed. I had uh, 12 public lectures and talks and, uh, you know, book launches, potentially at chapters all lined up and everything was canceled. So it was very uh, disappointing, but I was able to, uh, in the midst of the disappointment, kind of channel that energy into something productive. You know, I was very fortunate uh, that the Associated Medical Services continued to pay my fellowship for the year. Uh, they also um, uh, have a, agreed at least to extend some of the travel funding so that I can conduct some of that research I was supposed to do. So they've been very great. Um, you know, I don't I don't have any uh, children. Uh, I wasn't teaching sessionally, so I didn't have to, you know, suddenly throw everything online. Uh, and then everything was canceled. So there was no sort of external distraction. So I've actually been in this sort of writing bubble uh, and had a, actually quite a productive uh, pandemic. Um, and I realized that it's probably... Uh, a bit of an exception to the norm among uh, many people who are struggling and, and having difficulties. But uh, it's actually been a, a bit of like a writing retreat of sorts for me. And I've been able to kind of mitigate some of the sting uh, that first uh, set in when everything was canceled. So 
Hey, that's a great way to look at it too. And you know, you, you sort of dealt this hand, and we deal with it the way we can, right? The best, and you know, everyone's doing the best they can. So it's it's great that you have this opportunity. And, and two, you, it, it is disappointing, but you do have the opportunity because there is a confirmed paperback version coming out in the fall. And if everything goes yeah. well, maybe you can have some of these events. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, uh, you know. Maybe people are going to have some extra sympathy for me, and, and they'll be able to, you know, uh, buy the the book uh, that they might not have necessarily bought it. Um, and yeah, you're right. There, that there's a, a potential for having a, the the paperback uh, out in in November, and then we're going to uh, be able to do some uh, events moving forward as things reopen tentatively. Um, I have had the opportunity to do some Zoom talks and and some podcasts as well. So uh, there's been, you know some publicity and and the, the press has been really good about uh, uh you know providing some discount codes for some of these events which has been really nice as well yeah because as we all know university presses academic presses those initial release hardcover releases aren't always the most accessible in terms of price so it's great that they are uh, taking mm -hmm. advantage of that uh, and, and helping promote the book so let's get into it a little bit again yeah. the book is all about munitions disposal after the second world war and this is something that fascinates me as, as someone who, when I talk about either war, it's all about the ramp up, the fighting, or the cultural side of it. Never have I really given much thought to what happened after in terms of all the stuff that was built. Uh, you know, we talk about all the factories and, you know, the Rosie the Riveter image, images, but we never talk about what happened to all that stuff. So how much stuff did Canada have at the end of the Second World War that it had to then decommission or dispose of? Yeah, so that, that's actually a really interesting point to make because uh, not a lot of people do spend uh, time thinking about the, the sort of life cycles of objects and assets. Uh, there, there was a tremendous amount of assets left over now by comparison to, say, the Soviet Union or the United States, Canada's disposal problem, as I uh, label it in my book, uh, was small by comparison, but still quite significant because the population was never going to be large enough to absorb all of the remnants of the war. Uh, so you're looking at like a phenomenal amount of uh, production. So there's a tremendous output in radios. There's a tremendous output in uniforms. There's a tremendous output in chemicals and explosives. Uh, Canada produces about 800,000 military pattern vehicles. Not all of them would be uh, available for disposal, but certainly a large portion. Uh, there were tons and tons of aircraft. You know, Canada had the third largest Navy at the end of the war, or, or up there in terms of its, its uh, Navy component, at least. And then there's a huge retrenchment that takes place. So Canada gets rid of all of its Corvettes and large number of destroyers. So there's just a tremendous amount of assets left over, and we haven't even gotten into like the built landscapes or the real estate uh, or anything like that, um, that that's left over. And it, it is all, of course, amassed uh, by the, the government through the Department of Munitions and Supply. And so a large portion, if not the, the entirety of it all, had uh, um, been procured with, with a good chunk of public money or you know, amassed through victory loans and, and uh, taxes and things like that. And so the, there was a desire among uh, you know, ha C.D. Howe and uh, his staff within the department to make the most of it. Uh, they understood that if they did not control disposal uh, in a way that uh, could at least mitigate the flood of assets that would be entering the marketplace, uh, they would set up a very difficult situation for economic recovery because it would lead to price deflation uh, among the uh, price of new goods. So, for example, and, and one of the examples I use in, in a lot of my public talks uh, is uh, about typewriters. So the government in expanding uh, its bureaucracy during the war acquired a tremendous amount of typewriters and when the war was over, all this extra office supplies, as the government was retrenching and certain uh, you know, elements of the military would no longer need these uh, typewriters, there was a big worry about a flood of typewriters undercutting the price for new production in the post-war period. And uh, looking back on the experiences following the First World War, 
when uh, there was not uh, a great deal of, of effort to control the disposal of assets, they allowed a flood of goods to enter the marketplace, and that eroded the pr production. And a lot of people that are planning disposal in the Second World War look back on uh, 1919 and 1920, and they only see failures, uh, mistakes. And it became a sort of motivation for them to uh, plan a, a better disposal strategy in the Second World War uh, because they linked uh, disposal after the First World War to the causes of the Great Depression. Well, I find that really fascinating because at the time, again, this is sort of the way it's been framed to me, and I'm certainly not an expert in this, but you have so much of manufacturing production being geared towards the war that how long would it take for factories and companies to repurpose what they were doing to a more straight commercial model? And would the 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 flooding of a market with surplus military goods really hurt that cuz you know just i'm i'm just wondering about that transition of towards back towards a traditional commercial consumer marketplace and the need for time for companies to do that within their factories would would there be that much of a, a problem to put out these used goods these surplus goods while companies re re uh, purpose their factories it strikes me that that would be actually a good opportunity to for, for organizations to repurpose what they're doing to rethink what they're doing and have a little bit of time in order to do it yeah that, that's actually a really great question and i spend a a lot of time in the book talking about it the the answer is is um, very complex and has a lot of like moving parts to it but you're right uh, there is a period in time following the war when factories are going to have to transition from wartime production to peacetime production. And in that process, those factory floors, when you're like rearranging, you know, the, the, the string of all of your um, uh, machinery and all your machine tools, right, and, and how they're arranged on the floor and getting rid of the machine tools that you don't need, uh, you're looking at not producing things. So uh, there was an expected gap in production that was going to take place. And the policymakers involved in disposal, as well as some industry officials, realized that uh, the surplus goods could be sold inside that gap, that that was the sort of like window of opportunity when the market would not necessarily have a lot of new goods available, but that there would be this a flood of secondhand goods that they could sell. And so what the government does, uh, it creates uh, an organization known as the War Assets Corporation. Today it's GC Surplus. Uh, and that organization is what the book is essentially based on. And they decide that they're going to create a, a system of reverse logistics. So they get all of the government surplus stuff and Instead of selling it to directly to, to end users, they act as a wholesale distributor and only sell to verified businesses, uh, governments, and uh, what, what you would essentially call or in a very broad category like social welfare groups, like from universities, relief organizations, schools, stuff like that. And in doing that, they allow these companies essentially uh, in an economic sense to acquire the goods that they had just produced for the war and then recondition them for civilian uh, production, uh, recondition them for civilian laws and safety standards. Uh, and that helped to maintain brand loyalty. It also helped to stock shelves. And it also created this sort of um, uh, sort of like logistical apparatus that at the very least, uh, made it more difficult for the black market to exist. So people would have to go to like licensed dealers to get spare parts for the, their car to fix up and instead of going to the black market and getting uh, um, the, the parts to, to do that. They would have to sort of go continue to go to the regular places, the, the normal channels of, of uh, acquiring goods. And so it was a very advantageous in, in that sense because it helped to maintain the status quo. Uh, there was a desire to at least some, maintain some semblance of economic uh, uh, stability in, in that regard. And it also helped to prevent 
uh, public safety issues, right? Because a lot of these military assets, they weren't built to civilian safety standards uh, so that they had to be changed and modified. And the War Assets Corporation didn't have the money or expertise to do that. So they, they, there's this relationship that develops with industry uh, in order to help them navigate what was a turbulent post-war transition because uh, the government had taken a lot of their profits during the war, and during the war, they had also gained a high amount of specialization. So how the the, the uh, Department of Munitions and Supply operated was through like an empire of subcontracts. So they would, um, you know, a, a major corporation like Ford would get a contract to produce, you know, uh, you know, a certain number of vehicles. And then Ford would issue a whole series of subcontracts for smaller companies to produce a particular part. And so you're looking at a very specialized uh, industry of, of companies that were only producing like nuts and bolts uh, for, you know, six or seven years and then not being able to accumulate the same types of profits that they might have to then reinvest in their own expansion. And so the government realized that they had to give certain favorable incentives to businesses to help them adjust but also that they had to give them, um, you know, things that they could, you know, practice on and, and recondition and, and sell in the interim while they're rearranging their factory production. So it's, it's actually quite a very complex question uh, and, and also a very insightful one uh, to ask, given the, the significance of, of it towards uh, uh, the post-war period and the recovery that takes place. Well, I'm curious to how much of this relationship then between the government and the manufacturers is one based off of need and necessity and how much of it is the government almost imposing a form of asset management you know how eager were the was business was industry to to engage with the federal government with these programs or was it more of a work telling you to do this kind of relationship so um, it's actually the other way around. Uh, mm. Businesses are some of the first people uh, or first groups to realize that there was going to be a, an issue at the end of the war. Uh, in, uh, let's say, like late 1943, uh, there, the war economy hits its peak of production, essentially. And right as they're reaching their peak of production, businesses realize that they were eventually going to have to compete against their surge in production in the post-war period. And they actually looked to the government to provide the answers. And it, at the time, uh, Howe and all his officials are uh, not really interested in thinking about what's going to happen after the war when the war still has to be fought. And so they uh, are, are resistant at first, but as the war develops, they start to realize that they're going to need to address this issue. The business lo lobbying, at least, um, uh, sort of propels a decision for the government, and they actually work together quite uh, uh, significantly. So a lot of the officials that occupy the War Assets Corporation Board of Directors, they are dollar-a-year men uh, that were involved in the war economy, but also businessmen uh, that were sort of loaned to the government for the duration of the war. And then you're also looking at a variety of industry committees that were set up to handle, you know, specific types of goods. So there's like an automotive committee, there's a, a, a rubber committee, there's a scrap materials uh, committee that helps the government formulate policies uh, that are suitable to the industries concerned. The one thing that, that there is some debate over, at least, is uh, what to do about the social dividend, um, right, that that. There were the number of groups and, and, and number of people in, in society that were concerned that the government was just catering to business interests by the end of the war. And there is certainly some, some truth to that. Uh, but at the same extent, they did establish a, a, a priority um, uh, plan uh, where you, you could get a priority designation if you were uh, another federal department, if you were a provincial or local government, and if you were some type of uh, public tax body, like that, that um, not, like a public body that got tax money, so school boards, for instance, hospitals, uh, they could uh, submit a claim to the government, and before. 
the government sold assets to companies, they could redirect them towards these institutions so that they could, um, you know, support reconstruction, support social welfare policies. And you're looking at like left wing progressives and lobbyists on that side of the political spectrum helping to create those types of policies. Uh, and it, it, for the most part, it succeeds. And there's a number of examples I can offer you uh, to explain that. And, and, and I talk about that actually at length in Chapter 5. It, it is a relatively successful policy, but it does inhibit um, the sort of straight line uh, uh, disposal through corporate channels. And, and you're looking at the right wing and um, businesses not being very thrilled at the prospects of having to share some of these uh, leftover goods. Well, one of the things that, that strikes me as you're, you're discussing that is, you know, if businesses have this concern and are a part of this process, one of the narratives that, again, emerges, and, and again, somebody who's not an expert in the field, is that one of the reasons that the North American economy does so well, particularly in the manufacturing economy, does so well after the war is that Europe is destroyed. Right, Western Europe is in tatters. They don't have a, a manufacturing base. So I, I find it curious that industry was concerned as early as it was, given what ends up happening, or at least the narrative that emerges afterwards of the basically un, or sorry, f sorry, the, of North American industry not really having competition from Europe and therefore being able to grow and expand. And you get things like the Marshall Plan that, that helped to facilitate that growth. So is that a disconnect in reality or are they just not looking ahead to what's going to happen after the war? Well, they don't know that things are going to occur the way that they did. Um, they, there's certainly a turbulent post-war transition that does not create prosperity uh, immediately. Right. Uh, the 1945 GDP uh, um, is is about just under 12 billion, I believe, and the 1946 one is, stays roughly the same. So there's actually quite a bit of, of uh, issues. There's a lot of strikes and tension and unrest in, in the North American economy. It doesn't sort of uh, get itself up and running until later in the into the 1940s. I, I, at least I would argue. Um, and I guess in the in the middle of the war, they're they're concerned about about the post-war period. They're concerned about the return of of the Great Depression. That's the big thing that that's overarching uh, all of these discussions. That they, they are terrified that. Um, a, an inevitable uh, wartime a boom will lead to an inevitable post-war depression worse than the 1930s. And no one wanted that to happen again. So I think that that's the big motivating factor. Uh, and uh, a lot of the things that the government does uh, that are you know outside the scope of the book, but also within the scope of the book, are geared towards um, making sure that that Great Depression or that second Great Depression doesn't happen again. And, and that seems fair. I mean, you know, people of, of our age will talk about their grandparents who lived through the Depression, you know, in the 2000s, still not wanting to make long distance phone calls. Right. Like that, mm -hmm. the, the, the long term ramifications of living through the Depression certainly affected how people thought about money. And it's, it's curious to live through this moment, too, of how people, younger people than us, you know, who are sort of in their formative years, how this particular event will have a, the impact on them long term. And if it will, you'll see sort of the same thing as what happened to people during the Great Depression. It's sort of a curious thought experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, definitely. I think I think our grandkids are going to look at us when we're um, washing off the grocery bags uh, you know, 10 <laughs> years from now because that's the the uh, the new habit that COVID's created. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're doing some things that, yeah, even six months ago seem, would seem so weird that, we, that we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let, let's talk about, you mentioned the, the social dividend and some of these organizations. I, I, I have to laugh. I know universities in 2020 are, are different from what universities were doing in the 1940s. Uh, but the idea that universities are not, you know, businesses is kind of hilarious to me. Um, <laughs> but but let's let's talk about this. Like what sort of stuff would be of benefit to some of these groups and you know th there's certain things that obviously they would not be able to use and, and I do want to talk about munitions in a little bit but what type of, of objects that are being created for war use would be of great benefit to these organizations and 
what would prevent them from having uh, an adequate supply of them prior to the war? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the Depression hit uh, universities quite heavily, and there was very little expansion prior to the war. And uh, I, I believe the number of students roughly in 1939 was uh, around 35,000 in universities in particular. Uh, in 1946, uh, the uh, universities took in something like 35,000 veterans, uh, one of the most successful rehabilitation plans and programs that the government organized was um, involved in the Veterans Rehabilitation Act, and that uh, provided educational benefits to a variety of veterans. So you're looking at like um, close to 100,000 to 150,000 or so veterans who took up the government on that. Uh, most of uh, them go to what were called vocational schools, which would essentially, I think, translate to our college system today. And there they, they were able to take their tactical training as, you know, en engineers, mechanics, radio operators, administrative clerks. Uh, they were able to take some of that tactical training that they would received and then uh, find practical applications to it. So the mechanic um, who fixed up Jeeps during the war comes home, takes some courses and, and opens up a mechanic shop uh, as part of his rehabilitation after the war. So there's actually quite a, an interesting storyline there of, of taking that tactical and uh, training and applying it in a practical environment. And the same could be said in, in the university environment as well. The problem was these institutions are blindsided. There is a massive surge in the number of people that are there. Right? We talk about the double cohort as being a real problem uh, in our day and age. Well, just imagine the massive cohort of soldiers that started to suddenly appear in classes. You know, classes went from like 50 people one year to 300 in the next, and those people needed chairs to sit on. They needed tables. They needed rooms for classroom instruction. If you're uh, in a science field or a medical field, you needed assets inside those classrooms for instruction. And because many of these soldiers uh, had been away for you know six or so years where the government had provided them with food and clothing and shelter and pay, they didn't necessarily have a, a place to stay. And they might, well, because of the, the glout of people going into these programs, many had to travel far away so that you needed dormitories, you needed beds, you needed uh, mattresses, you needed cutlery and kitchen supplies. And of course, all of these things the government had because the military had acquired them for training purposes during the war. And so there's this actually kind of ironic story where the veterans, having just finished their six years service, uh, sleeping on uncomfortable cots in, uh, you know, army huts for most of the war, go off to the university for the better post-war life and then realize that they're sleeping in a dorm that is the army hut <laughs> on the army cot, on the bedding that they had just thought they had gotten rid of. And that is exactly what happens because these universities start buying up all of these assets in order to provide dormitories, in order to provide classroom instruction. Uh, there's some really interesting pictures that I have of, of um, some of these army huts being installed actually at UBC. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's a really, like I said, a, a social dividend here is because these universities are just blindsided and they need these assets to uh, help rehabilitate the uh, veterans of the war. I mean, you could make a case that some university dorms today are probably less comfortable than that, you know, in my experience. Yeah. <laughs> Not the yeah, worst thing in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's for sure. And, and I guess uh, uh, as an extension of, of the, uh, my answer to that question, too, uh, you know, universities are not the only ones that profit because you're looking at like the Red Cross and other relief organizations that are taking the, the same types of things and then selling them abroad uh, to help with that devastation in Europe and Asia. So right. There, right. There's, there's a lot of things that are going on there. Yeah. And in terms of like vocational schools and, and that side of it, too, I, I think of the airline industry as one that sees remarkable growth, not only because of the technological improvements in aviation during the war, but also now you have all these people who are trained to fly, who mm -hmm. want to continue to fly. And, and certainly the airline industry expands in part because you have pilots that you don't really need to train. So mm -hmm. I, I, I do see that it's not just a case of 
recycling or reusing stuff, but also the skills that people have can be seen as part of this process, I would imagine. Yeah, very, very, very much so. And I would also venture an argument, and, and I, I make this uh, um, in Chapter 6 of the book, where uh, the, the generation that survives the Great Depression and the Second World War is, is as thrifty as they were creative. And they have the, a very important skill set uh, that uh, enables them to, like, tinker and renovate. They have a mechanical proficiency uh, that uh, I, I don't know if existed in a previous generation or a generation since – uh, that enabled them to make their own success. I think that's that's certainly uh, um, a theme to, to to talk about more. And and you're right. Like a lot of these pilots, they get together after the war, and uh, in some cases they submit these plans to government to buy a whole series of surplus planes to open up new airlines across the country. In other cases, you're looking at Air Force veterans who get together. They make a company that uh, their entire business is taking apart aircraft and using the parts to build new things like uh, um, wheelbarrows and uh, other types of like mechanical levers and, and forklifts and other things like that that they're, they're operating. A wheelbarrow with an airplane wheel would be the greatest wheelbarrow in the the history of wheelbarrows. Yeah. Like they that, they uh, they actually found that the tail wheel of most aircraft was highly suitable to be a replacement on wheelbarrows. Wow, I, yeah. wouldn't that be too heavy? I, I realize I'm thinking of it in terms of modern airplanes, but that would be heavy to push around. Uh, I suspect so, uh, but maybe that gave the thing balance. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about the, the technical specifics. I haven't <laughs> really thought about that, but you're, you're right. I imagine that when you're, you're taking a, a, a piece of technology and applying it to a secondary or tertiary function, that there's going to be some relative inconvenience involved. So. Right. Right. Uh, so, so I, I do also want to talk about munitions. Uh, it, it's all well and good to take, you know, planes, cars, typewriters, and repurpose them for public use. A little harder, I would think, to do that with bullets and bombs. So mm -hmm. l let's let's get into this because my what what I would have pushed for as someone who is largely irresponsible is let's all go out into a very isolated part, like a desert somewhere, and just blow all this stuff up. It would be fun. It would make a loud noise. Let's do that. Uh, but what, what was the actual approach of people who are responsible to deal with the amount of munitions that were left over? Um, ironically, they did do that. Uh, they <laughs> would uh, put... Um, the, the British Navy put about 6,800 tons of high explosives uh, into the German fortifications that were on Heligoland Island, which is located in the North Sea. And then they blew them up in uh, April of 1947. And I, I've seen the video. It, it looks like an atomic bomb goes off. It's just right. a massive uh, explosion. Uh, but that's only 6,800 tons in some small corner of the world when the, the British military is estimating there's a 1.2 million ton surplus just in the United Kingdom. Canada has a, a, a huge amount of leftover assets. The Americans are even huger amount of material spread across the world. Uh, so they do do these these controlled detonations. They do burn um, a variety of, of the uh, compounds like trinitrile toluene and cordite. They do set these massive fires. But you're looking at toxic smoke. You're looking at air and soil pollution. Uh, and in some cases, when they're you know burning mustard gas in Germany, uh, they realize that, that they're they're going to have to evacuate entire towns and villages because they're just like blanketed in this toxic smoke. And other things like that. So they do do these massive uh, explosions and things like that. But with these controlled detonations, it's actually quite difficult to orchestrate because you need a, a very large logistical network. So in order to get rid of the the scale of explosives and make it you know worthwhile to detonate that amount, uh, you need a rail network. So moving something to this remote place was going to actually be very difficult. Because in, in order for a rail network to exist, there had to be a certain, you know, industry, there had to be, you know, a, a pre-existing presence of people in that area. And you need a lot of space, right? Uh, Canada built uh, during the war about 
144,000 tons of TNT. And if we were to put all of that in one location and blow it up in one go, uh, that would be equivalent to about eight Hiroshima sized uh, detonations. Wow. So, yeah, so it, it, it's a big problem to, to, to get rid of these assets, as you explained. Uh, and then on top of that, you're not going to be able to bring it all in one go. So you're going to need a storage site with probably armed guards. The storage site needs to be lightning proof so that no, no accidents happen prior to uh, the uh, detonation. And so, like I said, that there's all these you know questions and, and logistical issues that need to be sorted out. And they are, uh, you know, the military uses, you know, incineration, controlled detonations um, whenever they can. Uh, but for the most part, they realize that the most straightforward and efficient way of, of getting rid of some of these assets, especially the, the dangerous and more volatile components, uh, was by throwing them in the oceans. Uh, and so a lot of my research since uh, I finished the book and, uh, has been uh, into examining the history of underwater munitions. Uh, which is a, a really troubling and, and um, you know, sometimes terrifying uh, history where, you know, millions of tons of conventional munitions, um, you know, tens of millions of tons of, of chemical weapons uh, are thrown into the oceans um, after the war, uh, after both wars for that matter. Uh, and they're still there. They're down there corroding away. Um, you know, there's an energetic danger. Uh, some of these assets can wash up on beaches and, and injure, uh, you know, beachgoers and tourists. They impede offshore economic development. Fishermen can catch them in their nets. Uh, you're looking at wind farms being uh, problematic, uh, you know, digging down to the seabed. Pipelines are also an issue. Uh, and then you're also looking at, at a, a potential for um the uh, carcinogens and the, and the chemicals and some of the degradation products um, leaching into the environments, being consumed by fish. And then, you know, those fish get consumed by other fish and then those fish get consumed by uh, humans. And there's a, a, a concern that they're bioaccumulating in food webs uh, and potentially causing cancer uh, in other areas of the world. So, uh, there's definitely a, a really troubling legacy uh, that's related to uh, the environmental, um, the environment and, and the war, and and it's certainly something I touch on in my book. Uh, but it's also been the, like I said, the uh, sort of um, you know the main thrust of my research in, in the last few years. You mentioned earlier the industry was concerned about a depression because of the First World War. So here we have, that's an example of people leaning on the post First World War experience to try to govern and direct what's gonna happen after the Second World War. After the First World War, you have environmental concerns in Belgium and France. You have places where you know, water can't be drunk, for instance. So why are people not using the same logic that they that some of these industrial leaders were working on the environmental side of it? I mean, the, the stuff that they're using didn't get any better in terms of what it would do to the environment. So why was there not a similar push, or maybe there was, and people just they didn't just listen to them, uh, to redirect the efforts away from what was happening after the First World War into finding a more responsible way to dispose of some of these items well there's a, a variety of, of factors that are kind of pushing against um uh, uh changes from how they address things after the first world war so following the first world war there's a number of scientific investigations that are conducted into the environmental impact of tnt and other uh, aspects uh, or sorry other uh, chemicals and, and explosives and things like that and the results came back inconclusive uh, and that inconclusive and uncertainty uh, tended to favor uh, politics. And so you had political and government leaders that could then step in and sort of uh, uh, define what was known as acceptable risks, uh, define the thresholds for introducing pollution into marine environments. Uh, that And the scientists uh, didn't mobilize uh, a, a strong defense, mainly because... Uh, the results were uncertain, and there were views of the world as being, um, you know, s something that cannot be disturbed by human action, that the natural environment was too stable 
uh, so that the, some of these prevailing assumptions that existed at the time uh, uh, conditioned uh, disposal strategies. And uh, following the Second World War, some of these lessons were taken up um, and the environmental issues that were related to disposal uh, were kind of lost to institutional memories. So they kind of repeat the same mistakes because they didn't necessarily realize what they were doing um, uh, would uh, uh, create the, the sort of difficulties and dangers at the time. And on top of that, they, they had a lot of things uh, on the go. There was a lot of issues that were prying at their time. And disposal is always something that we don't, uh, as a population, I guess, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about. You know, when we put the garbage at the curb, that's about the end of our interest and concern for what happens to it. And you could make the same sort of general argument that officials were cons weren't as concerned about what would happen to all the leftover stuff as they were about the new technologies that were appearing, the new political landscape, uh, the new international order that was being formulated, that they weren't as necessarily concerned about what to do with the old stuff. And the, the most straightforward uh, way of dealing with it was, um, you know, thinking about what had happened after the previous war and then just mimicking the same methods. And that's essentially what, what happens after both wars. And on top of that, you're also looking at, at a variety of, of places like dump sites that had already existed, uh, you know, after the that were created after the First World War and already in existence in the Second World War. So it was very easy to just say, oh, well, we'll just put the munitions in the same spots. Right. And there is it's strange, though, because there is this romance. You know, I've been to the Western Front from the First World War a few times. I know you've done it as well. And there's a romance to the iron harvest for whatever mm -hmm. reason right, today. I find it kind of depressing, but yet there is a romantic element to it of you can just go find stuff. But you know, I realize the ocean is a big place. And I, I can see why people say just put it all in the ocean because, you know, for hundreds of years, you filter everything into your waterways. But that mm -hmm. that's the one that, you know, just throwing bombs into the ocean the unintended consequences of that just seems so obvious in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, and I agree with you, but when you, you get down and you start looking at the context of these decisions, um, the ocean floor was as inaccessible as the moon, uh, perhaps yeah. even more so. Like the deepest the submarine could go was like 200, maybe 300 meters. Um, you know, no one had, uh, you know, gone to the deepest ends of the oceans. Few people understood uh, the, um, you know, the oceans, uh, you know, the, or the science of the ocean at the bottom of the uh, seas. And, um, you know, uh, scuba diving, you know, professional and recreational didn't really exist. So th the chances of recovery were very low. Uh, as long as you ensured that they took place in designated areas that were outside of fishing uh, zones, uh, which is uh, essentially what transpires in the government departments that are responsible for the fisheries and, and uh, uh, oceans, uh, they approved these uh, uh, decisions because they, they, they believe that dumping is going to take place in these specific locations. And for the most part, they try to. Uh, but um, they generally uh, dumped while the ship was in motion so that these locations are actually, these dump sites are actually quite spread out over time. And so, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of unintended consequences that come out uh, because, you know, what gets written on paper isn't always what transpires in practice. And, and there's a lot of issues that, that develop out of that. Right. Uh, so how successful would you say f these programs were for Canada? What percentage of stuff were they able to actually successfully uh, dispose of, whether that's selling it off, recycling it, using it for these social dividends. You know, how, mm -hmm. like how, how would you assess the success of the post-war disposal of the military items? Yeah, that's a, a difficult question to, to answer. And I would state that it's very successful, but it's also very not successful. <laughs> um, if, if that's a, an answer, you can't, I you can't take it, both sides, Alex. Come on. <laughs> um, well, let's say it, it depends on the asset involved. 
um, because there are some assets that are highly reusable uh, that are put to very good uses after the war. Uh, there is also a, a lot of assets that are um, sold to be disassembled, and then in being disassembled, they're put to multitudes of different uh, uh, benefits. So I think that there's a, a, a really sort of storyline of, of success that surrounds, you know, this reuse and reducing and recycling that takes place, um, that there is a certain level of sustainability that is uh, created within the post-war economy as people are adjusting to uh, a shortage of new goods, but still wanting that material opulence that they kind of expected to have in the post-war period, and then being able to do that by acquiring surplus goods. So I think that there's actually quite a success story involved in that. Um, but at the same extent, the the disposal strategy and the reverse logistics involved were, were designed to uh, support the status quo. Uh, and so you're looking at, at a really... Um, uh, you know, unrevolutionary, shall we say, uh, a method of disposal in the sense that, you know, if you were a startup company, you had a pretty difficult time getting through the uh, sales restrictions. Uh, if there was, if there was an established business, a pre-existing business that was dealing in the same assets. So there's a certain level of, of, of solidification that takes place within the corporate world. You're also looking at, um, you know, a regional distribution of goods. Uh, a lot of the war economy was located in central Canada, Ontario and Quebec. And so those provinces, um, uh, you know, reap the rewards of disposal far more than other regions of the country, especially in the north. And then you're also looking at, at a variety of groups and minorities in Canada who may not necessarily have had access to um, uh, surplus channels and, and you know the the sad story of, of the the Japanese Canadians who are of course you know suffer uh, you know horrible um, um, you know dispossession of all their goods and are forced to live in in um, you know in internment camps throughout the war. Um, a lot of those you know fishing vessels that were confiscated by the government are actually sold through war assets at the end of the war and they're sold to new owners and not you know given back to to the people who rightfully own them. And so there's a certain level of, of compounding um, that takes place, uh, the you know, the, the compounding of the dispossession uh, that takes place across Canada that, that's really problematic. Um, and, and then on top of that, you're, you're looking at, at the massive environmental contamination that, that continues not only um, on, underwater, but uh, a lot of the training grounds and a lot of the war factories were placed on expropriated lands. And a lot of that land actually came from indigenous communities. Uh, and you're looking at, uh, you know, unexploded ordnance being a really huge challenge for some uh, groups across Canada. You know, you, you spoke of the iron harvests in uh, France. Well, there is iron harvests in Canada that are all related to training operations, because at the end of the day, Canada's most important contribution to the war was its space. Uh, we became a, a proving ground for um, you know air uh, for airmen uh, in the British Commonwealth air training program and we became a proving ground for military forces going overseas and in becoming a proving ground you needed space for training you needed weapons ranges you needed to test a, a new weapon systems some of which were duds and you're looking at a lot of unexploded ordnance uh, originating in you know the Okanagan Valley um, you know and, and in other places uh, in Ontario even uh, so you're looking at, at iron harvest in, in Canada as well, and, and these sort of compound the legacies uh, of the war and uh, those negative legacies, I should say. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, it's, it's a hard question to answer because I see a lot of positives and productive elements, but then there's also these sort of drawbacks that kind of keep me from saying, uh, you know, it was an unmitigated uh, success. Which is why people should go read the book, because it's a, a complicated yes. question. So uh, where can people get the book, and where can people find more about your work? Uh, uh, well, they can uh, find more about my work. Uh, I've, I've certainly I've published in some uh, uh, scholarly journals. Uh, there's a, an article that's specifically on uh, underwater munitions in Canada's dumping program that's actually in an open access journal, Canadian Military History. Uh, you can also get the book uh, at uh, UBC Press directly. Right now, the hardcover is the only one that's available, but the soft cover will be available uh, in uh, November. You can order it on Amazon, uh, and um, I 
have a number of blog posts that are out there too, some with active history as well. So uh, there's definitely no shortage of places for people to, to uh, learn more about this important subject. Yeah, and we'll certainly link to a bunch of stuff with the post associated with this podcast. Uh, so if you just head over to Active History, we'll link to a bunch of stuff as well to find Alex. So again, the book, War Junk, Munitions, Disposal, and Post-War Reconstruction in Canada. Alex Suchin, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Sean. So there you have it, my discussion with Alex Suchin. Of course, my thanks to him for joining us. Again, the book is War Junk, Munitions, Disposal, and Post-War Reconstruction in Canada. You can get it from our friends over at UBC Press. Hardcover available now. The paperback will be released in the fall, but you can pre-order it now if you want. So that'll do it for this week's episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever it is. You get your podcast. Give us the likes, the ratings, all that fun stuff. Keeps the show going. Helps other people find the show. And of course, if you have any ideas, thoughts on the show, you can get in touch, historyslam at gmail.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at the Sean Graham. So we'll be back with you again next week with a new episode. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.